Hello everyone, I'm the Enforcer and welcome to the breaking news. Today's breaking news started just south of Saratov, an English air base, near the small village of Krasno Armeysk, as we got to see that Russian air defense shot down some of their own KH-101 missiles that were being fired towards Ukraine overnight. We can actually see the pictures of the debris right here, as we look at the two pictures, apparently taken by some Russian citizens or some Russian armed forces inspectors, showing that the missile had in fact been shot down deep inside of Russian territory, and most likely by Russian air defense, that was based around the English air base airfield perimeter. From what we understand, Russian-friendly fire incidents, as far as the ground air defense firing at air targets, has been rapidly increasing over the past few weeks, as Russian and Ukrainian attacks have been increasing much more prevalently, with more Russian missiles and drones flying out of Russian territory towards Ukraine, and a larger volume of Ukrainian drones flying from Ukraine and deep inside the Russian territories to attack Russian oil refineries and other forms of critical infrastructure, this appears to have created a complete breakdown in communication in between the air defenses and what is going on in the skies above them. Due to this, we've been seeing that Russian air defense has gotten extremely trigger happy in shooting down any air target that they may believe is a Ukrainian one, including missiles that were most likely fired just over the city of Saratov, maybe a little bit farther behind in between Saratov and Samara, and ended up flying on their way over Saratov and towards Ukraine. For some reason, Russian air defense, I uh, surmise that this was in fact not a Russian missile, but in fact a Ukrainian one, because a Ukrainian missile was apparently wanting to go home. But nevertheless, they did end up shooting it down, and they are showing that the friendly fire incidents are once again massively increasing. We have a reason to believe that these massive friendly fire incidents that we're just continuing to see over and over are apparently because of all of the public unrest inside the Russian Federation and all of the projectiles and targets, and not only that, dissent that there is, especially within this area of southwestern Russia. Now, we can see that as today continued on, another fire began in the city of Belgorod as free Russian army forces have continued to bombard the city, although we're seeing no visible frontline advances. We can see here the fire continuing to burn quite heavily, and once again showing us that the Free Russian Army is still continuing its artillery bombardments. While it's continuing its artillery bombardments, we're not seeing any kind of notable advance by the Free Russian Army forces, and we're seeing that they're largely remaining within their areas of Shevakino and Gryvron, and not attempting any further advances, possibly suggesting a lack of manpower to take the initiative and take more ground, or showing that the Russian Armed Forces and Border Guard air forces in the region have apparently started to outnumber the Free Russian Army, and they've now been contained into these areas. We're not exactly sure which one is the correct statement, but we do know at the moment, regardless of the statement, regardless of the reason, the Free Russian Army appears to have ceased their advance further into Belgrade. Moving on out of this area and down into the very southern region of Russia, near to the town of Machkachala, we got to see that apparently there was some counter, quote-unquote, counter-terrorism operations that were underway by the Russian government. According to what we've heard, they have announced an anti-terrorist regime in the region, and we believe that this is more so connected to the Ingushetian uh, Free Army, which we've seen in the area, or the Ingushetian Liberation Army, and that their operations may have expanded all the way over to the very border of the Caspian Sea, on the very edge of the southern Russian Don area. We can see these Russian FSB operatives here holding up an apartment that appears to possibly be on fire. And once again showing that Russian descent, at least within the southwestern region, is still quite high. This may once again, like I was saying just a moment ago, be an action of the Ingushetian Liberation Army, an armed group that was created in the middle part of 2023, funded and supported by the Ukrainians, which conducts partisan operations within the southern area of the Caucasus Mountain region. Their primary reason for conducting these counterterrorism operations is the liberation of the Caucasus Mountain region people, including the Ingushetians, the Chechens, the Dagestanis, and many other groups that have been oppressed by the Russian Federation, according to their words, for the latter part of over 200 years. This information is largely true. Genocides have been conducted in the area by the Russian Federation in the past, and we believe that the Ukrainians are largely supporting and stoking the fuel of public dissent and public distrust of the Russian government that already existed before Ukrainian interference was involved. Nevertheless, it is tying up Russian uh, efforts and resources that are valuable at this point and desperately needed inside of Ukraine, and it's once again showing that they are on a very precarious situation, especially in the southwestern part of the country, where a lot of their military operations inside of Ukraine are planned and then executed as they're then moved into Ukraine. 
Speaking of which, it appears that those casualties that have been climbing inside of Ukraine have climbed heavily enough that with the next call up to serve or the next mobilization order handed out by President Putin inside of the Russian Federation, it appears that they're going to be calling up 150,000 new Russian citizens to serve within the Russian military for a one-year contract. This is a very normal part of the Russian Federation's mobilization procedures. Every year, uh, at least twice a year, a uh, decree is put out for uh, the conscription into the armed forces. There is a spring and a fall decree. This one appears to be for 150,000 Russian soldiers and is once again showing that they're having to keep up their continuous conscription efforts and conscription numbers to try and keep the armed forces running. We also understand that while this is supposedly supposed to be a one-year contract service, which is called a contract Niki, inside of the Russian army, a Russian service member that only serves the minimum uh, required time of conscription, which is one year, most of these contracts extend on into duration, especially when these units enter the Ukrainian front line. They may serve for much longer than a year. They may actually serve uh, up into two years, maybe two and a half years, or they may serve until they're dead, one or the other. But beyond that, we are seeing that the Russian Federation is continuing its conscription efforts and trying to get more Russian citizens into the Russian army, most likely to continue to feed the war machine and to try and keep the entire thing operational and running. Ukraine has had a very good understanding of this and is continuously trying to find ways to limit the amount of resources that this never-ending body of Russian manpower has to work with. And one of the ways that they've been attempting to do this is by destroying the Russian port infrastructure inside of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk, destroying valuable Russian ships that could be used to fire off missiles into Ukraine and further support the effort of Russian land forces that are on the ground within areas of occupied Ukraine. From what we've seen inside the port of Novorossiysk, it appears that the Russians are starting to partially block the harbor to try and stop the pass of Ukrainian naval drones into the harbor and trying to attack the extremely vulnerable ships that are within this area. To show y'all exactly where this is within the port of Novorossiysk, if we zoom into the Vostochny Rayon area, which is the naval harbor, we can see the opening exactly right here. This is the opening into the Russian naval harbor, where you can see a decent amount of Russian naval ships, including the Kilo-class submarine pens, right here in the very center of the Vostochny Rayon. We can see here that in this satellite picture, which is oriented about 160 degrees uh, counterclockwise, we can see here that there have been barges placed at the very entrance of the Vostochny Rayon, once again trying to make sure that naval drones will have a harder time trying to make it in. Not only that, but we can see that the southern entrance this area right here has a clear net and some kind of other defensive structure that has been set up to once again impede the ability of Ukrainian drones to make their way into the opening and into the port itself to begin attacking Russian naval ships. This has become a massive concern of the Russian Navy even after the crippling losses at Sevastopol and the major move of the fleet from Sevastopol and into the area of Novorossiysk, we can see that they're still greatly concerned that Ukrainian drones do have the range and the ability to try and strike these Russian ships while they're inside a port and are trying to give themselves the best chances of trying to at least keep some of the fleet surviving on into the end of the war or maybe even just for several more months. Meanwhile, the Russians are trying to make sure that that brand new Russian manpower that is once again continuing to lose resources has some kind of a way to defend itself or at least supply itself while it's inside of Ukraine. And this has been a massive concern for quite some time. According to official Russian government statements, the Kerch Bridge is no longer used for the transport of military equipment as it's been deemed too dangerous and too precarious to rely their entire supply route on a singular bridge that has been proven to be easily damaged and knocked out in the past several times over. They are now trying to work on a southern railway corridor through Ukraine, and we actually have one highlighted here on this map in orange. This is the actual railway route that travels through the area of southern Ukraine and has been proven to be extremely volatile as it's quite close to the front lines in some areas and can come under Ukrainian artillery barrage, which can knock out the railroads or even knock out the locomotives that are traveling along the links of these railroads, although we rarely ever get to see video and picture evidence of such a thing occurring. Nevertheless, it does occur, and it is very concerning to the Russian Federation to see that such vital supply lines are under direct threat, both at the Kerch Bridge and also on the rail corridors that travel through the southern area of occupied Ukraine. Because of this, they have been working on a brand new railroad, which we have been able to find a map of right here. The brand new railroad is going to greatly reduce the distance that these trains have to travel, and not only that, it is going to move the railroad much farther away from the active front line. Instead of being nearly 15 to 10 miles away from the front lines in some areas, this new railroad is going to be the absolute farthest away, around 50 to 70 miles away from the front line, putting it almost right out of HIMARS range at the best case scenario. 
this railroad is once again going to be pretty much taking the priority route uh, for Russian air defenses or Russian supply forces on into the future as the Russian ground forces will start to be supplied off of the Mariupol Railroad Corridor instead of the Volnavaka, Tokmak, and Melitopol Rail Corridor that currently exists or through the Kerch Bridge. However, prioritizing a single supply route like this does pose a massive amount of risk. Usually, the advantageous situation is to have multiple different supply routes supplying a singular force within one part of a country. Having a single supply route, which will be the new Mariupol Railroad, supplying all Russian forces within the southern occupied area of Ukraine does pose a massive amount of issues, especially if the Russian Federation is having to build railroad bridges for these trains to travel on within southern Ukraine. And while we don't know the exact layout of the land that they're building this railroad on, it is entirely possible that within some areas, like for example near the village of Orlivka, Russian railroad bridges will have to be built to try and support this brand new railroad. These bridges will serve a very vital uh, a vital connection for the, this Russian railroad network. And if any of these railroad bridges were to be knocked out, even if they are somewhat small, it will take several months to replace them or to rebuild them so that way the Russians can continue to use the railroad. This means that this railroad, in a sense, pretty much has the exact same problem that the Kerch Bridge has. It's just that these bridges will be smaller and more numerous, meaning that the Ukrainians will have the ability to attack these bridges at a much higher frequency and knock out this railroad corridor probably a lot quicker than they would have been able to with this with the Kerch Bridge. Not only that, but the Russians, considering that they may have to protect multiple smaller railway bridges, may not have enough air defense to spread out along the entirety of the route, meaning that this may actually be more vulnerable in the end than the Kerch Bridge ever would have been. But nevertheless, it does appear that the Russians are attempting this desperate move to try and keep Russian forces supplied within the southern region, from what we are able to know. At the exact same time, Ukraine is trying to make sure that the Russians cannot pull a fast one on Ukraine into the near future and have prepared a massive network, nearly a Magno line of defenses, in the northern area of Ukraine. We have heard that around 1,000 kilometers of fortifications have been built by Ukrainian forces inside of the northern region of Ukraine, near to the Kiev Oblast and other oblasts within the region, to stop any kind of future Russian advance into the area without them meeting heavy resistance and, in and taking increasingly high losses. This is one once again to ensure that the Russians consider the northern region of Ukraine to be an unadvantageous and suicidal route to take and therefore they will continue to fight the war within the southeastern region where the war has now been raging for well over a year and a half at this point ever since the collapse of that northern region during the first month and a half of the war. Beyond that, it does appear that the war is continuing on quite well for Ukraine, as most front lines have held quite steadily, and it appears the Ukrainian forces are continuing to make sure that they are able to keep a hold of their terrain, even against overwhelming odds, and inflict high casualties on Russian forces. That is all of the breaking news that we have for today. I gotta thank every single one of y'all so much once again for watching, and I gotta give a huge shout out to all the folks who are supporting us on Patreon. They help to make these video projects possible, and if it was not for our patrons, we wouldn't be able to keep making short war videos like these. If you have enjoyed, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and you can also support us on Patreon, and I will make sure to see you all in the next news report, which should be coming out hopefully by tomorrow. Or you can join us on the live streams, which run six days a week at 10 p.m. Eastern, time every single day except for Monday. But with that, thank you all so much once again for watching, and I will see you all in the next one.